we don't want to undermine or underplay any suicide because every suicide is absolutely devastating for a huge number of people. The, the ripples and the round of suicide are, are incredible. And, and the idea that it takes away one person's pain, well, actually, it just gives pain. It, yes, pain yeah. So every suicide is significant, but what we've looked at is although it looks like our rates are higher than in the UK, that's basically because of the difference in population sizes. There's not a, a difference mathematically in mm -hmm. terms of our rate that we can be definitive about. Yeah. But that's based on the one year that we're people are particularly worried about. But mm -hmm. if you look back at the data, and I think it goes back to 2009, yeah, 2009 there's yes. been a gradual increase, yes. and we're not going to hide away from that, we're not going to shy away from that, and it far precedes COVID. Can I just add yeah. a bit on that as well? Not in every case, but the um, again, the evidence is that um, a lot, a lot of the majority of people who then ultimately go on to take their own lives have not been connected with mental health okay. services or have reached out to help and support. And I think that is another reason that we need to be doing the work that we're doing because it's around saying to someone who's feeling rubbish, you know, and it's, you know, getting worse and worse and worse, do you know what? There are some people out here, um, and you know, just go and talk to somebody or know who to talk. Um, but it's interesting that those people that get that go on some boots often haven't. Actually, around the prevention, which obviously is coming up this weekend, it's National Suicide Prevention. Well, yes, That's, World Suicide there we go. Prevention Day. And that, and is that the best way to prevent it? Then it is, it is, if not feeling yourself like you need to talk to somebody, but pointing it out to other people. I think people are very. Um, very anxious that if somebody is expressing dark thoughts, intrusive thoughts, mm. um, that people there, there is there are myths that you know if I actually talk to them about this, I'm a I'm going to make it worse, or I'm going to put ideas in people's minds, and so people mm. naturally perhaps shy away from actually discussing yeah. uh, really what's going on for people. But often, if somebody's having suicidal thoughts, the only person they're really talking to is themselves, and that's mm. just amplifying their thoughts. They're not looking at different perspectives. Yeah. They're perhaps not seeing opportunities for hope um, that somebody on the outside mm. may see or that fact that there's even somebody there that can actually help yeah um, so when we do we do lots of training around uh, sort of suicide first aid and part of our mental health first aid training we um, we also touch on this in obviously my suicide um, Samaritans training but we um, we try and encourage people to actually listen for perhaps triggers in conversations yeah there, but not to be just scared to say you know, what did you mean by that yeah. Um, you know, tell me a bit more, you know, how are you feeling? Mm. And just to try and up, open up those conversations. And if somebody does express thoughts of suicide, that actually really just trying to explore that actually means to just try and help them. Yeah. Um, and then they're not just talking to themselves, they're actually talking about it and somebody's listening without judgment, with some empathy, not telling them what to do or judging them, but actually giving them space to explore what's really going on for them and then hopefully they can then perhaps see that actually there is an option yeah. other than death, that there is more hope. There's, there's an old adage building what Joe's saying is that suicide is a permanent solution to what's generally temporary mm. problems. But I don't think I've ever seen, and I've known people personally and professionally that have ended their lives, I don't think I've ever seen a simple case where you can think this one thing happened and then that person did that. Actually, it's always complicated, mm. it's always a multitude of things, mm. and that's why the person feels so overwhelmed by yeah. exactly as Joe's saying is if that's internalised and it's just going round and round and if you keep them to yourself they mm. get bigger and bigger and bigger until they almost explode mm. and even if you're just sitting with someone and talking to them even if they don't have the answer it's like a pressure release valve and hearing yourself talk through things mm. you can start to make sense of things you can start to contextualise them you can start to decide actually how overwhelming how strong they are mm. to help guide yourself through them. The other person, obviously, if they, if they can be helpful as well, that, that's great, or they can support you in getting mm. appropriate help. I think the, the difficulty is, is people just don't want to reach out. So there is more of an awareness, there is more of an acceptance on one level, but there is a group of people, and it's men, predominantly, yeah. that don't acknowledge that things aren't okay, that don't have the social networks, and when they are feeling desperate and they are feeling overwhelmed, they're more likely to use drugs, they're more likely to use alcohol, which both disinhibit, which both affect your mood and also re remove your inhibitions, so make you more likely to do something. Men also are more likely to do something that they can't come back from. So whereas a female might 
cut themselves might take an overdose, a man is more likely to do something much more violent, which you're not going to be able to get saved from. So it's that, that sort of combination yeah. of things that make things particularly difficult. And that's why we mm. see, both in Guernsey and internationally, the rate of suicide generally is four probably three to four men for every one man. Yeah, yeah. And there's been lots of awareness campaigns, hasn't there, around talking and around men talking. But is there still that fear of talking, I don't know, acknowledging the thoughts in your mind or, you know, fears that well, people might look at you differently? Do you think, I think that... It's probably the latter. It's yeah. that fear of being vulnerable, of exposing yourself, mm. of what other people might possibly think. Um, yeah. I think it's slowly changing, and I think that is a yeah. positive thing. But it's like turning around a tanker. You know, what, what we're trying to do with the strategy is to change the trajectory, so yeah. the direction of the island is going in changes. But there is not one thing that we're going to be able to do that will say, well, that will stop suicide. It's so multifaceted, so complicated, it's so individualised in every case that actually we have to change our culture to change our ability to be able to talk to each other and talk about these things. Um, I talk a lot about the stigma of suicide. People say, well, we really want to destigmatize suicide somewhere. We don't. We want to really stigmatize suicide because it's a terrible, devastating thing. What we want to destigmatize is being able to talk about it, and that's the way that you're feeling, and that you really need help, but it's the awful, the most awful thing you can do for yourself and everyone around you. And in terms of talking, if people don't feel able to talk to their loved ones or colleagues or friends or anyone real, they can phone the Samaritans, obviously can't they? In Guernsey Mind, again in a small island, you might know someone that works at Guernsey Mind, but the Samaritans, yeah. it's just a friendly well, listening so, voice. Yeah, absolutely, and I think one of the myths perhaps that we can, we can dispel really is that if you're in Guernsey or you're in mm. and you phone the Samaritans, the chances of you getting a volunteer in Guernsey are like, this morning. yeah and also even if that did happen unless you say who you are or where you live or what have you the volunteer is not going to even know that you're in Guernsey anyway uh, but basically all calls would go into a national mm. pot if you like yeah I'm sure it's more technical than that you know you could end up talking to somebody in Aberdeen you know or Bournemouth or any of the other mm. um, 200 you know there's 20,000 volunteers over 200 branches so it could be across anywhere mm. in the um, uh, in, the, in the whole of the network, uh, you can email as well, um, as well. So there's different ways of getting in touch. And again, it is literally, you know, it's as not as anonymous as you want as you want to make it. Yeah. And and you often find that it's the initial contact that really causes people significant mm. anxiety. We work in a really small island. We live in a small island. It's very difficult mm. to be anonymous. Mm. But men have bowel cancer screening, mm. prostate screening, women go for sort of cervical screening and have breast yeah. examinations, you might bump into your psychiatrist, your, your endocrinologist, your urologist, yeah. your gynaecologist in Waitrose. Actually, once people have gone to an initial meeting, I've had people from MSG, I've had GPs in my clinic, I've had nurses, I've had social workers, mm. we look up for everyone, yeah. it's, it's confidential. You know, there's, there are lots of reasons why people might come to the Oaklands you know, our meeting rooms are available to everyone, they're not just used for mental okay. health services. So actually, just because you're sat in the waiting room doesn't necessarily mean you're yeah. into someone you know and they'll know exactly what your business is. Yeah. It, it's far more complicated than that. But we do maintain confidentiality, but we're particularly aware that that's even more important in a small place. Really. Mm. And we, we have similarly people come and see us for one-to-one -one appointments, and sometimes you, you don't recognise the name, or you walk in and you realise you know them. And, and we always say, you know, do you want to see somebody else, or do you want yeah. to? Uh, you have to see us, and very often people say, "Do you know what? Actually, I'm pleased with you." You know, cause it's, a, it's a friendly face, yeah. or, or I feel that comfortable, yeah. and, and we, we just deal with it professionally. Yeah. But if they knew it was you before they came, they probably wouldn't. wouldn't. Come. And that's, that's yes. the okay. So, yeah. so actually, getting over that hurdle, yeah. mm. I think actually people are really quite yeah. willing to but the strategy is about so much more isn't it than preventing suicide because it's the mental health and well-being strategy isn't it and yeah. so if well-being is really kind of like that bottom pillar because yes. everyone should look after their own yes. mental health and well-being and obviously the crisis points kind of as you go up the pyramid but there's so many facets isn't there of of the strategy yeah and I think the previous strategy had five steps. We put in a further step, which is the building blocks for health. Okay. Because for health and well-being, so mental and physical health and well-being, you need to have you need to look at your environment, your built environment, where you live, mm. your employment status, um, 
so much else, your community, your connectivity, your social mm. interactions. So we feel all of that's important. And what yeah. we want to do is try and ensure that all islanders are living with good mental health and are flourishing. So yeah. we feel that's important. So we feel that obviously the services that are provided by Specialist Mental Health Service mm -hmm. are of paramount importance. But if you look at the building blocks for health, so their lived environment, all the things I've already mentioned, is that affects each and every islander. And focusing on that will mm -hmm. ensure that we are as healthy as we can be. And from a public health perspective, but also from a steering group perspective, mm -hmm. we feel that's very important. Okay, so there's going to be annual reviews against achieving the KPIs. Yep. <laughs> so there's going to be annual appraisals and then a, um, it's a five-year strategy. Do we have any plans for what's going to come next? The strategy is going to evolve based on those annual reviews? It will evolve based on the annual reviews. We were absolutely clear we didn't want to have KPIs that wouldn't change at mm. all. Is we'll look at the KPIs, new evidence is emerging all the time. And it would be absolutely yeah. remiss of us not to integrate that new evidence into any strategy. So once a year, we'll look at the um, a strategy review, but we'll look at the key performance indicators on a quarterly basis. So we'll be okay. continually monitoring. We'll only report on it once a year because we want to be agile in, in what we produce. Mm -hmm. We'll do an annual report, mm -hmm. which will include um, progress on key performance indicators. Mm -hmm. We'll then, what we call rag rate our so we're down the green, so green means that we're on track. So we might have an indicator that we only want to achieve in three years' time, but we feel that we're on track to achieve it yeah. in three years' time. So that will be not complete at the time we report, but it will be on track, yeah. so it will be green. There'll be other areas that we're concerned about, mm -hmm. progress will be amber, and obviously things that we're really concerned about will then be rated as red. And that RAM rating will then be done by the steering group. And Back to the advantage of the steering group, it's a multidisciplinary yes, yeah. group. And we really feel that that is the strength of our group. We're getting input from so many mm. different views. And we feel that that will help us progress in a meaningful way. And the, the other strength I think of it is because it's been produced locally, two things. One, it doesn't cost anything. And the other thing is that we have ownership over it. Because mm -hmm. I think there's all, often a lot of criticism for various state departments about getting external consultants in, and then nothing really happens, it's not really implemented, mm -hmm. and you spend 50, 100,000 pounds. That's not really the case with this document at all. So the strategy is our starting point. It's given us an agreed, um, agreed way in which we want to progress and we'll then be working hard on, on trying to achieve those key performance indicators. In terms of those key performance indicators or any particular part of the strategy, for the three of you, is there anything that you individually really want to see achieved or are really interested in seeing how it progresses over the five years? I think there are two areas that I find okay. particularly exciting and, and it's going to reflect my public health view. Yeah. Um, the one is the collation of data. We've got so many data sets that are available in mm. different, from different sources. So to have a single data set that we feel impacts on mental health and well-being, yeah. that we get data from public health, from other states' um, states analyses that they do, from Guernsey Mind, mm -hmm. from Healthy Minds, from Primary Care, and Primary Care have been absolutely superb in supporting us in developing strategy. And again, they haven't charged us, they've just come and yeah. done a collaborative effort. So I think having that data set that we can analyse our results on, and it's local data to develop local policies. So obviously we'll compare the data to other jurisdictions, but having that local data really does inform our local policies. The second thing that I'm really excited about is mapping and getting those um, service users, those maps, the referral yeah. criteria, mm -hmm. where people can get help, how the services interlink. So developing that information mm. that will we feel not only will be valuable for healthcare, health and care professionals, um, for the general mm -hmm. sector people providing services, but also for islanders. They can yeah. think about what help is available where. And I think there has been a criticism in the past that there's just there's so many different organisations with different names and how they're interlinking. So actually developing that linkage, I think, is really important. So those are the two things I'm particularly... And Nikki Pinch that was what I was going to say as well, very much so. I think that would just help so many people to actually understand where to start. We often mm. get people just phone up and say, I don't know if you can help, but I phoned you 
because I go domain or whatever mm. and X, Y, and Z. Um, but so having that central resource, yeah. I think, would be um, really helpful. Um, I, w- I would say this, wouldn't I? But I do think we're, we're very much looking forward to bringing in what's called a supported self help model that going to mind. And, and so that's a very uh, a low level intervention, but I think that will be another opportunity to give people mm. some skills yeah. to look after their well being. And I, I hope that that will be something that will develop and will really sort of sit quite nicely under the other services that are available. So we'll, we'll see. Okay. So not to open everything. So, so it's interesting, we did a briefing to the politicians yesterday and there was a, a panel at the front and there was politicians in front of us and it was very much, you know, we were the experts and the politicians were the sort of people with mm. action of what our decisions were and then there was the community. And, and it just struck me that actually we're, we're separating ourselves out from yeah. these different groups of people whereas actually we're all part of the community. This is in everyone's interest. Mm-hmm. I don't know anyone that at some point in their life hasn't struggled in some sort of way. Um, and actually for the community to take ownership of the strategy and to be really keen and pushing it forward and playing their own role so that it feels like a really collaborative effort and that's whilst I obviously value our relationship with the third sector with the other parts of nature, so you and the other parts of the third security, if the community can get on board and start doing things with us and mm-hmm. for themselves, I think that would be the real sign that it was achieving what we all wanted to do. Thank you for listening to The Interview, a Bailiwick Express podcast. If you liked what you heard, please like and subscribe. You can find us on all social media channels, and if you'd like to keep up to date on all the work The Express team does, please sign up to our daily email by visiting gsy.bailiwickexpress.com.